Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. In the last unit, we talked about structural relations. We talked about um, dominance, precedence, C command, and government. In this unit, we're going to talk about one of the possible applications of those, which comes from what's called the binding theory. The binding theory describes relationships between nouns in the sentence. So relationships where one noun might refer to the same entity as another. And we discover that there is, in fact, structural conditions on those kinds of relationships. So when you have two nouns that refer to or do not refer to each other, they often have to be in particular syntactic configurations, which we can describe using the structural relations that we have discussed. In order to talk about this, we have to um, uh, talk a little bit about different kinds of noun phrases. We are going to be um, talking about a kind of noun phrase known as an R expression, which includes proper names, common nouns, pronouns, those are things like he, she, it, his, and anaphores, those are the words that end in self, for example, in, um, in English. Um, these noun phrases are se semantically distinct, and we'll talk about that semantic distinction, but we'll find that they also have distinct syntactic distributions. So they appear in different syntactic positions. In order to do this, we have to talk a little bit about some terminology, so that we have that terminology under our, be under our belts to talk about the relationships between the nouns. So let's first of all talk about our three kinds of noun phrases. Our first class are R expressions. The R here stands for referring. So they are referring expressions. Although ironically, they don't actually have to refer to anything in the world. It's just that they could. So these are the noun phrases that express content. So um, they, uh, they, for example, a name like Bill Clinton or William, or a description like the woman in the blue suit, or um, a common noun like a teddy bear, or a noun phrase that um, contains some kind of modifying information like the purple shoes. Those are all R expressions. Second class of nouns we're going to talk about are called anaphores. The phenomenon that we're talking about is sometimes called anaphora, but when we're talking about a single uh, noun of this type, we call it an anaphore, and when you have multiple ones, we call them anaphores. Um, these are words in English uh, that end in self or selves, and then there are a couple of additional ones, um, like each other, uh, that we call reciprocals, but they're also anaphoric. Now, what anaphores are, are they noun phrases that get their meaning obligatorily from some other noun phrase in the sentence. So, for example, Heidi bopped herself on the head with a zucchini. Herself here is an anaphore because it gets its meaning, its reference, from the name Heidi, which precedes it in the sentence. The, the herself here cannot refer to anyone else. By the way, uh, this sentence is about uh, my good friend Heidi and uh, we'll see some more sentences like this later. It's about uh, a little food fight that my friend Heidi um, and her mother and I had one day. So um, please don't take offense at these sentences. They are just, um, they're just describing a fun evening we had where we were um, using vegetables to um, get the better of one another. Uh, no real violence was committed. Okay, so... Anaphores are NPs that obligatorily get their meaning from other noun phrases in the sentence. Our third class are pronouns. Now, pronouns are noun phrases that can get their meaning from another word in the sentence, but they don't have to. They can also get their meaning 
from some other thing in the discourse, or even just by context, like what you see around you. So, uh, for example, I can, if I'm looking around and I see um, a person, I can say, she left. And we're, we all know who we're talking about because we see that person in the context. So that word she is getting its meaning from the context. But there are occasions where pronouns also get their meaning from nouns in the sentence. So for example, Art said that he played basketball. This is one, impossible, one possible interpretation of this sentence is where the he who's playing the basketball is Art. Art said that. But note, it's also possible that that pronoun can refer to somebody completely different. So uh, Art, you know, it can also mean that Art said David played basketball. Uh, Art said that he played basketball, that he could refer to somebody else, right? So typical pronouns um, include uh, I, me, you, he, him, she, her, it, one, we, us, they, them. Also, the possessive pronouns, his, her, our, my, its, yours, and theirs, they're going to be a little tricky because in the uh, preceding uh, units, we actually refer to those as category D instead of category noun. But for now, we're just going to treat them like they're a special kind of pronoun. That um, fact that they sort of behave like determiners, but they also behave like nouns, is something we'll have to think about and come back to. Okay, so we have our three types of nouns. We have our expressions, which are referring expressions. We have pronouns, which may get their meaning from uh, another word in the sentence, or they could get it from context. And we have anaphors, which obligatorily get their meaning from a noun phrase in the sentence. All right, let's, let's next talk about some terminology for referring to what is giving its meaning to what. So uh, we have this term antecedent. Antecedent refers to some noun phrase that gives its meaning to either a pronoun or an anaphor. So for example, in the sentence, Heidi bopped herself on the head with a zucchini, um, Heidi is the antecedent of herself. Uh, so that anaphor gets its meaning from uh, Heidi. Um, one thing we're going to want to be careful about here is if you know any Latin, the word antecedent contains in it the word, the, the morpheme ante, which means before. And you might think that the relationship at stake here is one of precedence, because you'll see that, in fact, Heidi does precede the anaphor. A little deeper probe later on will show you that precedence is neither sufficient um, nor adequate to explain the relationship between antecedents and anaphors. So the, uh, the ancestry of this word, antecedent, the Latin root, is misleading. It doesn't, the antecedent doesn't necessarily have to precede the, um, precede the anaphor. And furthermore, uh, even if it does, that's not necessarily sufficient. So uh, just be careful about that if you know what the word antecedent comes from. Uh, but for us, what's important is that the antecedent is the noun phrase that gives its meaning to either a pronoun or an anaphor. Now, we have a specific means of expressing these meaning relationships between nouns. And this is called indexing. Um, it refers to your index, your finger, right? Uh, so uh, it's also a mathematical term. It refers to little subscripted letters that we can put afterwards to mark a pointing. So each index represents a different reference, a different individual in the world. And you can think of that little letter as a pointing. So in our first sentence there, Colin gave Andrea basketball. We have three different indices. We have the I, we have the J, and we have the K. And the I points at the reference to Colin. The J points at the reference to Andrea. And the K points at the reference to the basketball. So um, just think of those little letters as being little pointing markers. And we can use these points 
these little indices to indicate when items refer to the same individual. So for example, in sentence number C, uh, Art said that he played basketball in the dark. We see that Art and he both have the same index I. That means they refer to the same individual. Same thing when sentence D, Heidi bopped herself on the head with a zucchini. The herself refers back to Heidi, so they share the same index I. I've indicated this here also with color, but color is not the traditional means of indicating this. I just put it in my slides to, because I think it makes it a little more transparent when two items uh, refer to the same individual. Now, how do we decide what index a noun gets? Um, what we do is we start at the left-hand side of the sentence. We identify all the noun phrases. And note, by the way, it's noun phrases, not just nouns. The noun phrase is the thing that bears reference. And we start at the left-hand side, and we assign each noun phrase an index. Now, for reasons that are um, completely arbitrary, we always start with the letter I. So the leftmost um, noun phrase in a sentence is always going to get the, ref the index I. And then we work our way down the alphabet. Now, sometimes we skip J and L because J and L, when they're subscripted, are often a little hard to distinguish between I. So sometimes we skip those. It doesn't really matter. It also doesn't matter really that you start with I. You could start with B or Q or whatever, but the tradition is to start with I. Now, when we have two noun phrases that have the same index, we say they are co-indexed, co-indexed, the same index. So if we look at sentence A here, in the first sentence, there are no nouns that are co-indexed because there are no items that share the same index. In sentence B, by contrast, the, um, the noun phrase art and the noun phrase he bear the same index. Um, so they have the, the, the same little subscript letter. And that tells us that the interpretation we're talking about for this sentence is one where um, he is referring back to art. This is the way that we are going to um, notation, notationally mark ambiguity in sentences. So for example, this sentence by itself, without any of these indices, is ambiguous. Art said that he played basketball in the dark could refer to art or it could refer to someone else. When, as linguists, we're trying to distinguish those cases, we use these indices to mark that. So the difference between the meaning where the he refers back to art and where the he refers to somebody else entirely is in what index you put on that noun. So, uh, for example, uh, in the B sentence, the co-indexed relationship is one where we say they co-refer. They refer to the same individual. That's that meaning of the sentence. And the one where they do not co-refer is indicated with the co-indexing in sentence number A.